you. Mel's like a sysadmin anonymous meeting. <laughs> I am a sysadmin. <laughs> I do computers. All right, we're going to talk about uh, Kubernetes, um, but we're going to try to do a deeper dive and cover the things that you should be interested in as a sysadmin, uh, thinking about Kubernetes. And I also will try to touch on some points of where does Puppet kind of fit into this world with a new set of abstractions to do applications. So here's a thing that I read about maybe five or six years ago. Um, it comes from uh, a book or a paper called The Data Center as a Computer. And Google had this idea that we must treat the data center itself as one massive computer. Okay? And the ideas behind this is that we want to abstract away the individual machines and just treat them as one logical thing. All right? So whenever you attempt to do that, the principles of distributed systems and distributed computing come in big time. So all of that research becomes um, actually useful in real life. Okay? Now, in order to treat the data center like a computer, what do you need? You need an operating system, all right? What would that operating system look like? It will feel a lot like the one that you use on a single machine, but it needs to have a different interface because we're not going to be able to log in to individual machines. Like, you don't log into CPU cores, right? So we need to think of the data center as a machine. So when you're watching the talk today, I want you to have this in your mind. What if you actually did that? If I took away your ability to SSH into any machine, how would you think differently about the way you manage a system? It's gone. You can never log in again. Some people say it's impossible. But I think you can get a lot done in that world. So Kubernetes, the first thing you have to think about, Kubernetes is a framework for building distributed platforms. All right? So it's not like you're going to download Kubernetes. It's going to have a UI that presents everything you could possibly do to the system. It's going to give you the foundation to build the tools that you need to run your infrastructure. So we're going to see in the live demo section of me building an integration with Let's Encrypt to automate the processing of certificates from an application using Kubernetes as a framework. Right? We want to stick to the Kubernetes way of doing things. I'm going to show you guys how to do that. So let's talk about this world here, where a lot of people question, where does Kubernetes fit in to the world? Right? I used to work for a couple years at Puppet Labs, have a lot of experience with Puppet. I was a user for three years before that. And I always saw Puppet as the thing you installed on your machines to provide an API to the system where there was not one before. Right? Instead of bash script, yum, app git, Puppet provided this DSL that allowed us to interact with these machines in a programmatic way without resulting to shell scripts. So in the Kubernetes world, Kubernetes sits right above the hardware layer. It abstracts it away completely. The thing that I want to think about here is not just automation and abstraction, but more of a contract. We need to change the contract between our infrastructure and the application. So we're going to decouple the app from the node. In Kubernetes, we do not assign applications to machines. There is no such thing as a node manifest, inventory, the scheduler will treat the individual nodes as just resources in this data center-wide computer. So when you hear questions like, does it work on OpenStack? Does it work on VMware? Does it work in the cloud? Does it work on bare metal? None of that matters. Can I run the Kubernetes agent on the machine to extract its resources? If the answer is yes, then Kubernetes will totally run. It has nothing to do with the platform you choose. Make that decision independently. Just like Puppet, Kubernetes is declarative, right? So what you're looking at here is me declaring that I want this particular application running. So this is Nginx. And here, the contract that we have between you, the developer, and Kubernetes is this container image, OK? The analogy I like to use here is like when you go to FedEx, you cannot drag a wagon of stuff into FedEx and expect them to sort it out and ship it. That's not going to happen, right? We call that throwing the code over the wall and assist that mean Tim sorts it out. At FedEx, there's a steep contract. No, no, no. Put it in a box. I don't care if it's in a box already. You're going to put it in a box that we can ship. If you put it in the box, I can tell you when it's going to get there. No box doesn't work with my system. 
So the container allows us to stop talking about Ruby versus Python versus Java. It just doesn't matter. You're going to take all your dependencies, and you're going to put it in the container. A lot of people talk about containers as if they solve the entire infrastructure problem. The problem is that people don't talk about containers in two different things that they are. There's one idea of the packaging format. There's the other idea of the container runtime. Those are two separate things, right? And they don't necessarily have to be the same tool. How many people here have actually built a container? How many people are using Puppet to build containers? I also disagree with this. And people will say, no, you're at PuppetConf. You must agree. <laughs> The reason why I disagree a little bit is because I don't know if it's necessary, because the things we need to create an image are different than the things we need to run a process in production. Think of it as a build pipeline, right? So in order to build something here, we look at this Docker file. Now close your eyes if you've never seen a Docker file. It could be terrifying, OK? So here's how we build a Ruby on Rails app, right? So here I'm saying from Ruby 2.3, that's probably going to bring in an entire operating system. Does anyone know why we bring in like a Ubuntu or a Red Hat in these container images? Because most people don't know what their dependencies are. It's a shotgun approach. Just take the whole OS and just shove it into the container. Guaranteed I'm going to have my dependencies in there somewhere. And if not, just yum install the entire internet. And you're going to get your dependency at some point, OK? Now, when you build, so this only has to run one time. This is where the confusion comes in. If it doesn't work, just change the line until it works. Check it in. There is no need to get super fancy in these files. Your goal is to build a self-contained representation of your application as dependencies. It's just a crush that we're using from Ubuntu as a starting point. Right? If you were building an application in Go, you can actually build something that's statically linked. No libc, no dependencies on the host. There'll be one line in your Docker file. Add the binary into the container. You're done. No base image, nothing. So this is really just a carryover for the way we do things. If you've never seen one of these builds, uh, they look like this. You guys prepare for this? I think I've already pre-built it, so it shouldn't be too bad. But normally, this will actually, um, this will actually Try to build the entire internet. I'm a little afraid to do this build uh, because I don't know if I have enough bandwidth to pull down Ruby. Let's see if we have it already. All right, good. We have one already. So you notice it's a gig. If you're a system and you're like, what the hell? How do we end up at a gig? Your app is a total of maybe 100K of source files. How do we get to a gig? And this is because our build tools are not sufficient for creating self-contained apps. They were all designed to run on a machine and have the dynamic libraries or the runtime live outside, and we would share those. But that didn't scale for us. So now we're doing the thing that we do in mobile, where we create these self-contained apps so we can make sure that they're portable and we have the contract between you and the infrastructure. So once we have this contract, we can specify, give it to the system, and it knows exactly what to do. Don't care what you have. No app you're building is special. I go to some companies, they're like, our stuff is special. I said, let me guess what it does. It starts up, it binds to a port, it takes traffic, and it does something with data. They're like, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> you're not doing anything special. OK? So we take that pattern, we put it in a container, and we send it to the API server. At this stage in Kubernetes, you just have your desired state declared. This is it. Nothing has to happen. Now, what we want to do is actually turn that into something that runs on the machine. But in order to harvest the resources from the machine, we need to install a few things. We need a container runtime. That's where Docker comes in. We need an agent that understands how to communicate with the master to figure out what it should be running. What am I responsible for running? So it does a watch. There's no intervals, no 30-second checks, none of that. This is straight up saying, I'm just going to watch. Whenever there's something for me to do, let me know, and I'll run it, and I'll report back status continuously so you know that I have the workload running. So once we have that, in order to assign this to the machine, we need a scheduler. How many people are using a scheduler? Everyone's hand should be up. Your laptop probably, how many people's laptop has more than one core? 
There's a Best Buy. Yeah, for the rest of you, there's a Best Buy nearby. <laughs> How you do it? That like that's what sysadmins do, right? In production, you fix it live. <laughs> All right. So I asked this question about the scheduler, and most people don't raise their hand. When you launch a process on your machine, something has to choose what CPU to run it on. Whose job is that? That's the kernel's job. All right. So now I have to explain scheduling to you guys. And the fastest way to do it, because we don't have all day, is to play Tetris. Okay. This is how we're going to explain this. Now, everyone's played Tetris before, right? God, your parents were not great. <laughs> this is pretty sad. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about automated deployments, OK? So in the world of automated deployments, everyone, you're at Puppet Comp, so how many people have fully automated deployments here? I guess that's why you're at Puppet Comp. <laughs> OK, so normally in automated deployments, this is the badass thing you do. You click one button, and then you just go for beers. I think that's what they do. You go for beers. But notice what's happening. To the left and to the right, that's your CPU. That's your memory totally going to trash. Most people are under 5% utilization of the compute resources. You're automating, but you're wasting a ton of money. I work at a cloud provider, so this is great for our stock. But it's terrible when you have to spend money that way. So when you use a scheduler, what we want to think about is when those workloads come in, we need to examine the playing field and figure out where they should run. All right? So in Kubernetes, we use a couple of uh, algorithms. The main algorithm we use is called bin packing. So in Kubernetes, when the workloads come in, of course, they're all different shapes and sizes. Uh, when they show up, our goal is to pack them on machines in a way that's efficient, right? Our goal is to reuse all the resources available as the workloads come in. And you notice here that none of our workloads are all the same, right? Like in real life, you can't say everything fits in the same shape box. But in Kubernetes, when we do this and the right piece shows up, then we have room in the cluster to run it. And just like any batch job, once that job is complete, we get all the resources back, and then we can reuse them for future jobs. I know some of you are impressed by the timing. <laughs> you can totally clap. Uh, some of you live in reality, though. So in reality, you already have some decisions that got made years ago. You tuck the job there, you're going to be a sysadmin, man, and then they show you production. You're like, oh, OK. You got some production stuff going. Um, and in that world, uh, things have already been deployed. It's not pretty. Uh, <laughs> you can install these cluster managers on part of your machines and let them manage some resources. So here's what we're doing in this particular case. And again, Kubernetes will just kind of work around what you have and kind of fill in the gaps as you go along. Now, some of you probably work in the enterprise. It starts with the E. How many people work at the enterprise? Say legacy really loud <laughs> if you work at the <laughs> It's classic. It's called paychecks. So in the enterprise, um, there's a few more challenges. Okay? The first challenge is everything's written in Java. Or COBOL. We don't have a letter for that. <laughs> um, and then the other challenge you have normally in the enterprise is that you got Oracle going on, right? Like Oracle is like on the back of the software, it says, do not automate. If you automate this software, we're going to raise the price. No automation. You're going to screw up our consultancy ecosystem. <laughs> so in that world, people always ask, can I just bring Kubernetes in in that world, right? And the truth is, uh, no. There is nothing we could do to help you uh, if you have that situation. You've lost, OK? So this talk isn't for you. You can't, you can't rub Kubernetes over your situation and make it better. You, you have to do something here, OK? So that's, that's what the, the scheduler is all about here. So now that we have the scheduler being very intelligent with our workloads, we can just start to sh put them in these boxes and let the scheduler go to work. So the key things we're going to talk about today are pods, 
which is a collection of containers. So most of the times, apps aren't made by a single, or a single component. You can imagine writing an app in Node.js, but maybe use, one, use Nginx to terminate TLS and just proxy back to the app. Those things need to be coupled together. Those are tightly coupled dependencies. A loosely coupled dependency would be the database, right? You scale those independently. The replication controller works like a cluster-wide process manager. When you say you would like this process to run, it will run somewhere on the cluster at all times. Okay? Then the server. Service discovery becomes critical in a system like this. You're deploying things based on these dynamic desired state definitions. Where are they running? What IP address does it have? So you need some form of service discovery. And we're also going to see volumes. So here's what a container is. Very simple. This is the image format. We're going to package our application all of its dependencies, and then we're going to give it a basic runtime config. How should it run? These are two different steps, though. You can almost package anything into this thing. It's a tarball, essentially. And then we can take that, and we can distribute it around. And we're all familiar with this process, right? Whether you're using RPMs or any other repository system, you take these things, and you push them to a repository, right? Very similar to what we're doing with OS packages, but these apps are self-contained. Then pods allow us to kind of compose what our logical application needs to look like. So we have this kind of resource envelope that will have an IP address that's shared. Volume can be shared between those containers. And this logical construct feels like a virtual machine. You can move it around and be guaranteed that it's going to be started and stopped as an atomic unit. OK? So here's what a replication controller looks like. Again, if I push this declaration to the server, and say, hey, I want foo, one copy running. It creates one from a template. The scheduler picks it up, and this happens. Now it's placed on the machine. We do not indicate what machine we want to. You could, but in very rare cases do you want to do that. If we bump the definition, what do you expect to happen? Two more get put up. If a machine dies, what do you expect the system to do? put one where it can run. And this is the thing that trips most people up, because you're not assigning these things ahead of time. You're just saying, I want three to run. It's the tooling and the controls plane job to ensure that's possible. And it does it by looking at the current state of the world. This is a lot different than scripting and pure automation. You actually need to take in what's happening right now to influence your future decision. You can't codify it all without having some way to take input and respond to the situation. This is what gives you this property. Also, how do we manage configs? A lot of people gloss over this when they talk about containers, right? Like, they still need configuration. It doesn't go away. PSA, we do not run Puppet in the container. Do not run Puppet in the container. There's no reason to run Puppet in the container, OK? You can use Puppet to generate these config files, but you want to store them in Kubernetes in a way that they can be propagated out by the runtime, and we'll see what that looks like. So in this case, we create a secret from a file. They're stored there. You can imagine replacing this piece with something like Puppet that's using ERB template and higher data to populate the contents of this secret. Doesn't matter who does it, but you can totally do that. Once the secret is in place, it can be referenced. In order to reference, we can build a deployment that says, I want to use that secret. And in that case, Kubernetes will do something like this. It will create the pod, take the data from the secret, and inject it into a temporary file system and present it to the container, just like Puppet would copy it over to the machine. And this follows the life cycle of the app. The app dies, the config goes away. You say you want 10,000 copies, 10,000 temporary file systems are created and injected. Okay? And then we can finish creating the pod. And then service discovery allows us to find all of these actors that are running in our cluster and sync them back to other endpoints. So the system will automatically create load balancers for us and keep them up to date with the backends. And this is all happening with watch semantics. There's control loops going in there and making sure that anytime there's an event, things are updated. Okay? It feels like real time. So how do all these things work together? We have all these Lego bricks. We have all these configs. How does it work together? So we're about to get into the live demo, and here's what it's going to look like. We're going to actually run a database on the cluster. You can actually do that in Kubernetes. A lot of people say you can't run stateful things. You can totally run stateful things. If you think about how hypervisors work, they do very much the same thing. You create a VM. 
the scheduler moves it around the hypervisor and the storage is attached. Sometimes you're running with local storage that comes from the hypervisor. There is no reason why containers can't do this. The problem with containers, though, is most people are not used to having this explicit list of file paths that they must present to their application. This is where it all falls apart. Most people cannot tell you exactly the devices and files that their data store needs. You put it in a container and it gets explicit, things break. So they say, oh, containers cannot run stateful things. You totally can do it. So we're going to show that a little bit today. And then we want to have applications use service discovery to figure out where that is, connect to it, and then we expose our application to the front end. Right? This is Ruby on Rails. So before we can actually use the app, we're going to have to do a database migration. Right? So we're not going to be in a world where it's just going to be perfect. We need a way of actually running the job later. So it's demo time. I ask you all to say a prayer to the demo guys to make sure this works. Uh, it's going to be uh, the rest of the way is going to be live demos. So what we want to do is get that application deployed. So the first thing I want to do is just make sure there's nothing running. And we don't currently have anything. So we need MySQL. Okay. So we're going to look at our deployments, uh, MySQL. There's a lot of data here. And the reason why I'm showing you everything is because as a system man, you need to know this stuff. As a deployment, I specify um, a little bit of metadata for my app. But the important bits here, I'm going to highlight them, is the number of things I want running. So I want one copy of MySQL running. I want to use the MySQL container at this version. And you notice here that I'm grabbing some secrets from Kubernetes as references. And in this case, I'm going to inject them as environment variables. And I'll show you another case where we put them on the file system. So I don't have to actually bake secrets into my configs. The other thing that is important is this piece. You can't play Tetris unless you know the size of the block. So a lot of people do deployments with no resource limits on the process. What's the ramifications of this? The app gets busy. It takes down the entire server. And then we just wake up and respond. Give them limits so we can actually predict how many instances do we need. We can just do math. If you say you want 10 copies of this, I know it's going to be 10 gigs of RAM. There is no need to monitor, because I know the kernel is going to enforce that contract. It's the contract that's important. These tools get better because they have contracts. We're bringing discipline uh, to how this works. So the scheduler will only run this where we actually have a gig of RAM free. If there's no RAM free, we can't run there. Okay? So we'll run this. So in Kubernetes, we use kubectl create. Hi, you again. Keep going. All right, so at this point, my MySQL container is being created. Now, here's the trick about stateful stuff. You got a couple of choices. I'm going to show you this deployment object again. Here, I'm specifying that I want to use a persistent disk from my cloud provider. This could be NFS, iSCSI, or any other block device. The reason why I'm doing this is so I can have my storage decoupled from the machine. The machine dies. I can recreate the process on another machine using that storage. If you mount storage from the host, how many people are on call? You're going to piss these people off because <laughs> you're going to lose your data. And then you have to restore from backup. So our goal is, as storage gets faster, as our networks get faster, whenever we can re-decouple the process and the storage from the local machine, then it becomes easy to move it around. We're not talking live migration here. We're literally talking unmount and mount it somewhere else. You can totally do that. So in this case, we're, we're doing that here. So let's see if our pod is running. So it's still being created. The next thing I want to do is uh, create a service for this so that other applications can find it. So I'm going to create this service, and then Kubernetes will create a DNS entry so that you can just call MySQL and automatically find where this container is running. All right? So let's go ahead and create this, kubectl create dash f services mysql. All right, let's see where we are. Container still creating. I'm hoping the demo guys are on my side. We do have our service entry for mysql. This is good. Let's see what's going on with this particular container. Oh, it's running. So at this point, I believe 
I have MySQL running, okay? The next thing we need is our web app. So let's deploy the application itself. So this application is called Lobsters. I got it from Hacker News, uh, or I got it from GitHub. It's a clone of Hacker News. So it's a Ruby on Rails project. I just built a container based on the data here and a deployment config based on how they want me to start it. Um, if you don't know about Hacker News, this will make you super popular at conferences. You read Hacker News before you go to the conference, and you'll know all the things going on in the tech world, and you just talk about this stuff like you know what's going on. For the people that don't read Hacker News, they'll just be like, man, he knows everything. He's totally plugged in. So Hacker News is what you need to impress folks. OK? So what we want to do is build a clone, all right? We're on the West Coast. This is enough to start a startup. Someone will give you money, I promise you. Uh, don't really need a business model these days. You just need something that works. So let's get something that works in place. So what we want to do now is deploy our application called Lobsters. Very similar here. Um, I'm just getting my database URL from a secret. So I have my secrets in Kubernetes. All right, so there's a lobster secret in there. In there is my database URL, database username, and password. And what I want to do now is create this container that will talk to my SQL. So create-f deployments uh, lobsters. All right, let's see what we got here. All right, we got one, one running. This is like high scale stuff right here. So we have this thing running, and we also have an IP address. So git svc, and we see earlier that I created a global uh, load balancer that will point to this here. So let's go ahead and hit this over HTTP colon. Ha ha, this is Ruby on Rails, so I expect that. <laughs> so we need to do a database migration. So we need to run a job one time, and then that's it. But we want to go through the same flow. No logging into servers, no special jump boxes. We just want to give a workload to the scheduler to say, hey, run this one rake task once until it becomes successful, and then kill it. So it's just like a web app, except for we just want to call one command and exit. So to run a batch job, in this case, we create a jobs object. So we want to populate the schema. So this command flag here, rake batch load, comes straight from their GitHub site saying, take this code and run that command once. And here I'm just telling Kubernetes, run it once and never restart it. But I'm also giving this memory and CPU limitations so I find the right machine to run it on, let it execute, and my database migration will be done. And I get an audit trail of all the jobs that have run in the system. So kubectl create dash f jobs schema. So what will happen is this will run kubectl git jobs. And we'll just do a watch here. All right, it's already done. So the container was pulled to a machine. The scheduler fired off. It ran. Rake task created. If this works, we come over here. We hit refresh. Ha ha. So we have our schema in place. Now the app is actually up. The next thing we want to do here is log in. And I know I need to actually create a C job to set the credentials. So we'll create uh, the C job here, kubectl create dash f jobs seed. So I wanted to populate the initial credentials once that happens. So it's still running now. The container's being downloaded. It's being scheduled to a machine. And there it is. It's finished. Same code as before. So we're running the migration using the, the same level of code. So we'll log in here. Now what we need to do is get content. So before you can actually uh, raise money, you at least need some content. Uh, anyone familiar with growth hacking? Yeah, so this is what growth hacking looks like. You go to a place that's very similar to what you want to do, and you borrow content, OK? So we need content. Obviously, we want good content, right? So it would be a shame to let all the hard work of Hacker News go away. So what we'll do is kindly borrow some stories. Ideally, you could, you could automate this, but that would probably be illegal, so I'm not going to do that. So, and then we need this URL, copy link address, and we'll just give it a tag. I am the author of this story in this URL. Yeah. 
hit submit, bam, we're looking good. You get all your friends and family to do this? <laughs> it's gonna be like, wow, you only have good content. There's just no bad content, all right? So now that you have this running, it's time to scale the app out. So what we wanna do now is just change the definition of what we're doing. So instead of going from one replica, uh, we need more. So let's go to 10. kubectl, apply. So we just wanna tell the cluster, look, you're at one. I just wanna change the state of the world to 10, okay? And what we expect to happen is that once Kubernetes gets this information, it goes off and it does it. So now we have 10 of these things running and they're automatically added to the load balancer because of service discovery integration. Okay, so if I look at the back end now, kubectl get svc, and I can just describe it. So without any extra work from us, Kubernetes automatically discovers all of our endpoints and places them behind the load balancer. So if something becomes unhealthy, it's removed. If something is added, it's added automatically. So we don't have to keep building these things over and over. This is fully integrated into the platform. So now that we have that, the next question is, how you do upgrades, right? Or how do you get logs? Remember, I, I took away your SSH access. You should be centralizing your logs. So we do actually ship all our logs to something like um, Logstash or inside of Google Cloud, the internal logging. But if you just wanna look at the logs ad hoc, remember you don't have access to the machines, you can actually use the API. So we can call logs, grab one of these container names, and we can follow the logs. And here we can see the logs, and if we sent live traffic, there's an API endpoint to get logs and also log into each of the containers if we needed to, right? This is really powerful if you need to troubleshoot. So once you have your content up, get pods, everything is running. The next thing you need to do, which is important, is hire a marketing team. The marketing team looks at this and says, ooh, white space. I don't know what else we should do, but white space has to go away. So what we want to do is create a new container, and I already have one built, and we're just going to customize the CSS to something a little bit more appropriate, and we want to roll that out. Again, we are not talking about nodes. We don't even know what nodes these things are running on. It's not important. The system will provide. So what we want to do here is take lobsters, and we want to just say, you know what? We have this new image. Uh, that's my new requirement, okay? So what we'll do now, let's see. So what we want to do now is actually see this thing roll everything out, uh, given the new image version. Let's make sure that I put the right thing in there. Kubectl get pods. Oh. One thing we have to do is apply that. So kubectl apply dash f deployments lobsters. So we sent this to the cluster. And now the cluster's job is to do a rolling update uh, based on policy. So let's do a watch here. And what it will do is roll over each instance. All right, it's already done too fast, but we'll take it. Um, but it does it by making sure that the instance is healthy first and then killing the next set of containers. And if this is working, then we should be able to reload the site and now marketing's happy, okay? Now, if you're a sysadmin, man, you're like, dude, there's no HTTPS. You're totally gonna get like hacked. This is dangerous, right? So how do we solve this problem? So this is the problem where I think Kubernetes being a framework allows you as a sysadmin to actually get creative. Wouldn't it be nice if I could declaratively say, I would like a Let's Encrypt certificate for this website. But I also don't want to redeploy this container. Right? I want to be able to do it in a way where I can secure this app without going back to the dev team. How will we do that? So in Kubernetes, we actually support custom extensions. So just like we've been saying kubectl get pods, we have these deployments, we have these services. What if I want a custom type? We get this in Puppet, right? So in Puppet, we can define new types that way we can continue to use Puppet the way it's designed to work. So we want to do that in Kubernetes. What does that look like? So the first thing we need is a set of extensions. So here's a certificate extension. I have my own namespace here. So this is going to run the Hightower.com. Um, we're going to have a new certificate object. So here I'm just going to create that in Kubernetes. 
We're just going to send this desired state up. And then what will happen is Kubernetes will automatically create a REST endpoint, storage inside of its backend, and manage everything to do with this particular state. OK? So once I have this new object, I actually am ready to have a new tool, watch for those changes, and do some implementation that when I see a certificate object, that it can go and interact with Let's Encrypt and give me a real certificate back. And we want that to happen behind the scenes. And when it's done, we want it to populate a secret. So let's run through that really quick. So we need a new pod. And this is going to kind of show off how pods work. So here, we're going to do something slightly different. I'm going to add Nginx right on top of the existing pod. So I'm not going to go back to the dev team. They don't need to do anything. Continue to do HTTPS. I'm just going to put a container right on top inside the same pod. That container is going to take in the HTTPS traffic. That container needs a configuration file because it needs to know how to proxy to its back end. Right? It's not going to do that magically. And then it needs some certificates. And Nginx happens to want to load the certificates from the file system. So environment variables won't work here. I didn't write Nginx, and I can't make it do that. So what I'm going to do is just add this container right inside the pod and then refer to two secrets. One secret is going to be the TLS certificate, and I want that to come from Let's Encrypt. But I'm not going to tell my app about Let's Encrypt. I'm not going to tell my system about Let's Encrypt. I want to hold the abstraction. So the next thing I want to do now is create this config file for Nginx. All right. So this is a basic Nginx configuration file. This is on 4.4.3, turns on SSL, looks on the file system for those two files, and it's just going to take any traffic and send it to localhost 3000. That's exactly where my Rails app is listening. So let's create this first. So if I look at my deployment, that needs to live as a config map named Nginx. So we'll do a kubectl create config map and then we'll call it Nginx, and then we can say something like from file, and just give it the file, and what it will do is just upload this as the name uh, on the disk. So we're pushing this, it's actually generate a object in Kubernetes, so now that will be our desired state. So now we have this config map in the system. kubectl get config maps. So that's holding our configuration file, uh, inside of that config map with the same name as the, disk, the thing that was on disk. The next thing we need to do is create the secret. But again, I want this to be automated. I don't want to go and provision certificates. So we're going to deploy a tool called Kube Cert Manager. Now I'm going to do something really stupid and like hit the production Let's Encrypt endpoint. I'm feeling lucky. Wi-Fi has been working great. There has been no issues so far. So let's up the ante. So what we're going to try to do is get a valid certificate from Let's Encrypt that my browser trusts and inject it as a Kubernetes secret on the back end so that my pod doesn't know the difference. OK? So I build in a custom type in Puppet. So what we're going to do now, this looks like a bad idea, but let's do it. So what we want to do now is start this controller. So this will run in the background. We're not doing any compilation. So we don't create providers and then recompile something. These daemons run in the background, and they're watching for changes. As soon as that certificate object is created, it's going to kick off the job, get the certificate from Let's Encrypt, bring back the results, and inject it in a secret real time. OK? No delays here. So kubectl create dash f uh, deployments kube cert manager. Now, this also has storage, so it's going to mount up so it can store all of this uh, things persistent. So get pods. So it's going to take a few seconds, and then this kube cert manager will start working. Uh, the next thing we need to do is create the certificate object. Right? So this is something that I defined. This is my own schema. So I have a new thing that Kubernetes never understood before. And what this is saying is that I can get a certificate for the domain lobsters.hightowerlabs.com, the email address, a little bit of data that's required by Let's Encrypt to issue me a real certificate. Let's Encrypt uh, will issue me a challenge token to see if I actually own the domain. And I'm going to have to populate my Google Cloud DNS with the token that I get from Let's Encrypt. And then if it checks out, they'll issue me a real certificate. And then I'm going to inject it on my file system. So let's see if we can get that to work. So let's say kubectl, get pods. So we see our cert manager is still creating. Let's make sure that there is no issues with it. Describe. Pods, kube cert manager. 
Uh, so it looks like it's been scheduled. At this point now, it's creating the volume on the server, making sure that it's attached and formatted, and then it will be mounted to the server. So while we're waiting for that, we can go ahead and uh, submit this job. So kubectl create-f certificates lobsters. OK. Now what we want to do is wait till this container comes online. It's online. So what we want to do now is see what it's doing. So let's do logs. Let's grab this dash C, because there's multiple containers in there. So I want to talk to a specific one, and I'm going to watch its logs. So here, it actually picked up my uh, object, and now it's actually creating DNS records inside of my cloud DNS. So if I hit refresh here, we'll see a new challenge token in place here. So here's my challenge token that I'm getting from Let's Encrypt. And I'm verifying that that DNS record has propagated over all the authoritative servers before I tell Let's Encrypt to go check and verify that text record in my domain. And if it works, this is production, so there's a rate limit on how many you can get. I'm crossing my fingers I haven't crossed it. If things work, it will give me back a, a valid set of certificates. Live demos with DNS is a bad idea always. <laughs> Never a good idea. Uh-oh. So now we're telling Let's Encrypt to go validate. Oh, snap. It noticed that the certificate is missing in Kubernetes, so it put it there. Now, this is great because at this point, I have the same interface for requesting certificates that I have for doing everything else in Kubernetes. If this is working, we say kubectl get secrets. I should see one for lobsters.com. And if you're doing things right in Kubernetes, delete secrets, because it's a declarative system. We don't delete the certificate object. We're only deleting the secret that's in, on disk or inside of Kubernetes. We delete the secret. What do we expect to happen? So we want our system to Usually you do reconciliation loops when you're in a distributed system, just to make sure you catch any errors that the, the watch doesn't return. So here I think I have a 30 second loop, and it noticed that the secret is missing and put it back, right? If I change the data, it would put it back. This is very similar to what we do in Puppet, but now it's running online. If things are working, we should be able to do a new deployment of our application with Nginx in, uh, installed. So this is going to be called Lobster Secure. And it looks pretty much the same. Uh, same image, 2.1. But the difference is we have Nginx in place. Nginx is going to load those secrets from reference. Kubernetes is going to inject them to the file system. And then it's going to come up, and I should have a valid certificate um, for this particular domain. So we'll do a kubectl apply dash F deployments lobster secure. It actually has the same name, so it's just going to overwrite the current state of the world. Okay? If I hit apply here, and then we say kubectl git pods. So you notice what it's doing here. It's doing a rolling update because the definition has changed. And it's going to do a rolling update in a way that's safe enough to keep at least, based on your policy, uh, minus one or plus two online. So we can have nine at a time or up to 11 in order to get through the rolling deployment pretty quickly. So as this is rolling out, we'll see at this point, this says that now I'm running the new definition of this application. So if this works, we need to go and visit the DNS name to see if the cert is valid, get SVC. We see that this IP address is here. So that's the lobster's front end. And then we come here and we see that that matches this domain name, okay? So lobsters.hightowerlabs.com will come here, HTTPS, lobsters.hightowerlabs.com, and we have a valid certificate from Let's Encrypt. With that, that's Kubernetes for Sysadmins. Thank you.